And as I was singing that along with the choir in this big open sanctuary, I was reminded of the scripture that says that he has exalted his word even above his name. What an excellent name that is. What a powerful name. At that name, every knee is going to bow one day and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that is to the glory of the Father. But he has lifted his word even above his name. It has been exalted even higher. And that is the word I want to give to you today. This is what we call the Bible. We call it the Word of God. This supernatural and divinely composed accumulation of truth for thousands of years by many authors. And this is what God has exalted even above His name. So it would behoove me today and you for me to reverently speak of it and from it and for you to carefully listen to what it says because every time this word is spoken, something eternal happens. You will never just hear a sermon or a message or a lesson, my brother. You will hear something that has the power to change you not only in this life, but in the life to come. And so I want to bring this word to you today. And the, the strange thing about the scriptures, the holy scriptures, and I've been preaching them now almost 50 years, studying them almost 50 years. I never get to the bottom. I can never plumb the depths of its riches and its truth. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus, who is the Word of God. So I want to go right now <clears throat> to a passage of Scripture, one of the Gospels, the book of Mark, the 11th chapter. And I want to give to you something that I believe the Lord gave me yesterday. It's an insight. In fact, it stunned me and I just walked the floors yesterday and I say it again in a, in a closed up room, searching my heart and the scriptures about this thing the Lord has laid on, uh, laid on it. So let me get with it right now. In Mark chapter 11. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, that's a very common passage of Scripture, especially in these days. But let's see what leads up to that particular teaching by Jesus. He was walking down the road <clears throat> and the Bible says Jesus got hungry. And so at a distance... He saw a fig tree with leaves on it. And so in his hunger, he goes to the fig tree and reaches up to get a fig, but there was nothing there. And Jesus cursed the fig tree and said, you will never bear fruit. And then they left. Now, the next day they were coming back by that fig tree. And one of the disciples said, Lord, look, it has dried up from the roots. And that's when Jesus said, if you have faith in God, you can do the very same thing. Now, this morning, I'm not interested in drying up a tree. And when he talked about a mountain here, I'm not interested in, in such uh, astounding faith that people imagine hills and mountains jumping into the ocean. Oh, it's much deeper and more spiritual than that. Here's what Jesus was saying. You can come to a place in your life that 
things which disappoint you can wither up and go away. With faith in God, things and people that you have depended upon at a moment to satisfy you and they never do, why you can have such a growing faith in God and dependence on God that those things will wither up, dry up and be gone. So then Jesus says to the disciples, whosoever shall say to this mountain, notice it, he didn't say those mountains or that mountain over there. He never referred to the whole mountain range. He said, whoever says to this mountain, I don't know where they were exactly, but they must have been close enough at the foot of a mountain for him to say, whoever says to this mountain, this particular mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And what Jesus was trying to tell us is, is that you don't just speak away all the problems in your life. Every day a new mountain arises. Every season brings a new obstacle in your way. And, and the Lord is saying, you can say to this mountain today, you'll have to deal with the other mountains tomorrow. But every situation in life that blocks you, that hinders you, that hurts you, Jesus considers a mountain. And he says, he, he, he doesn't want you to stand there and be befuddled by it. God wants you to make forward progress. But if you come to this mountain and you can't go any farther, you have faith in God and that thing will eventually be removed out of your life. Now, here's some things I want to say. Jesus compared faith to a mustard seed. And he said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain. That was in another passage. And I've often wondered, why, why didn't Jesus say, if you had faith the size of an acorn? Because that to me seems like the logical thing to do for this seed of faith to grow into a, a gigantic oak that can last for a hundred years. But he didn't use that illustration. He said, if you have faith like a mustard seed. Now understand, a mustard plant is an annual. That means it lives for one year and then it dies. And if you want more mustard seeds, you've got to plant it again. It's unlike perennials and it's unlike trees. You've got to do it again every year. Jesus was saying, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be gone. And when it's gone, you've got to plant again the next time. You've got to be ready for the next mountain, the next obstacle in your life. See, when you plant a mustard seed like everything else, you've got to have four qualities, four ingredients. You've got to have good soil. Now, let me say right now, if you want faith in God to grow, <clears throat> you're going to have to have these things. Good soil, meaning a good and fertile heart, a desire, a hunger. You've got to receive the Word of God in honest goodness, which is fertile soil. And then it takes water. You can't grow anything without water. Everything lives by water. And then you got to have light, sunlight. Did you notice that all of those things Jesus used as illustrations of the Word. The Word. That Word that He's exalted above His name. You can't have faith without the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You will never have a growing belief, a strong faith without the Word of God. You have to hear it. Now, for all the theologians out there, I know that Romans 10, where it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I know that is saving faith and that when you hear the gospel, you can be saved by the gospel. But I also want you to know that once you have that saving faith, there is a faith that has to be grown in you, nurtured. It's a faith that has to be planted 
annually or constantly or frequently. It's got to be nurtured. There's got to be good soil tomorrow. Even if you win this battle today, you've got to keep your heart right with God and keep your soul receptive to the word because tomorrow will require another planting, another plant. You've got to have more water tomorrow. You need to be washed by the water of the word. You've got to have more light tomorrow. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. When light comes in, darkness flees. Light gives life. So faith is not a one time I got saved thing. Faith is something you go to from different levels. You go from faith to faith, which means you have to do it constantly. But there's one thing, one element in this growing process of a plant I want to take just a moment and emphasize you got to have good soil, you got to have water, you got to have light, and you got to have heat. And I don't mean heat from the sun, I'm talking about the heat of testing and trying that tension that comes from being in the ground and trying to come up through the ground that tension of being in the world and having to fight the animals and, and bugs and fungus for something to grow. There's got to be the heat of testing and tension. And for you to grow in faith, my brother, my sister, you might have the best soil and you might read and pray all the time but you can never be unnerved by the heat of the test that comes. Every level you advance to in Christ comes because there's a test. There's heat. There's trouble on every hand. There's the tension of growing up in the environmental animosity. You, you, if you'll notice, every man in the Bible that God promoted was first tested. The one that stands out to me right now is Joseph. You know, before Joseph could become the second most powerful man in the world, he had to run away from a woman. He had to pass the purity test. He had served God. He kept the Lord's commandments. He loved God. And at that moment, at the moment of the testing, he had an opportunity to yield to the flesh or to stand on the word, but because he had nurtured his heart in the heat of the test. Well, hear me. In the, in the testing of his purity, he ran from the temptation because he loved God more than he loved anything else in his life. Here's what the Bible says. Let me just read it about Joseph. He's talking about how God prepared Joseph for Israel. He, God, sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Oh, please hear your pastor today. You might have done all the right things and you find yourself being tested by the word right now. You see, Joseph knew that God had his hand on his life. Joseph knew that God would not forsake him, but he was going through a time of testing where he felt alone and pushed out, even abandoned by God. And then in the midst of all of that, he gets the, the temptation to sin with a woman. But he stood up and said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The man that was destined for the throne was in chains and bound in fetters until that time, until his time, the word of the Lord tested him. Listen, some of you are right there right now. You've prayed, you've believed, you've fed your soul, you've stayed away from evil and you're in the heat where the word is testing you. God wants to know, do you really believe my word? When I'm not talking, when you can't feel it or see it, can you trust my word? Let my word test you. Let the heat of the word bring you to the place of purity so I can put you 
where I have designed for you to be. That's good preaching right there. We're talking about faith. And since we're talking about faith, let's talk about Abraham because he was the father of faith, so to speak. Since everything happens by faith in the kingdom of God, since all things are done by faith, and since Abraham was the example of faith, let's talk about him for a moment. Because when you talk about Abraham, you immediately think of an old man and an old woman who got a promise a long time ago, 25 years ago, that they would be parents and it was impossible physiologically for them to be so. But they believed God. And one day a baby came and people say, that's the faith of Abraham, that you believe you can get something from God when he promises it. Let me talk about another thing. I've never seen it before. What if faith is not what you can get from God, but what you can give up for God? You see, before that baby came, a long time before that promise came, Abraham had to give up a country. That means he had to give up all that was familiar to him and all the people that knew him. And he had to go to a foreign land as a stranger and a pilgrim. He was unknown. Before that promise came, before that baby came, he had to give up his house. See, he lived in Ur, a well-established community. And he was a well-established citizen of Ur. He had a house. But when God called him, he had to give up his house and live in a tent, a temporary dwelling. He had to give up all of the stability that normal people like. And he wandered about not knowing where he was going. I'd like to say that again. What if faith is not so much about what you can get from God, but what you're willing to give up for God? And then, because of his willingness to leave, to abandon it, and to walk in obedience, God gave him that son of promise. But that's not the end of the story. God said, I've asked you to leave your home. I've asked you to leave your family. I've asked you to leave your house, your country. You gave it up for me, but will you give up this last thing for me? Will you give up the promise? Will you give me back your son? Now that's where real faith comes in. Not that you can believe to get it, but that you can trust God to take it back. So, here's what I want to say to somebody right now. Struggling. You haven't seen an answer. Things are not improving. They are, in fact, worse than they were. And you think, well, maybe I don't have any faith. You know... Jesus talked about different levels of faith in the Bible. He said to one group, how is it that you have no faith? He said to another group, O ye of little faith. Then one day he said to a Gentile woman, wow, you have great faith. But then I read in 2 Thessalonians where Paul said to those believers, your faith grows exceedingly. Now, that's a whole different dimension right there. Your faith grows exceedingly. Why? Because they were being persecuted. They were losing everything they had and they still trusted in God. 
They were willing to give it up. He said to the Hebrews one time, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. You took it and with a smile when they stole all your property because you knew you had a better and more enduring substance in heaven. And that's where I want us to go. I want our faith to grow exceedingly. I want us as a church not to be people who can get it from God, but who are so broken and hungry for God that we're willing to give it up for God. Isn't that what Jesus meant when he said, if you're going to come after me and be my, be my disciple, there are some things you got to understand. There's a cross to be picked up every day. See, there it is, every day. Just like you have to plant your faith every time you come to a mountain. You have to start the whole process watering, receiving, reading, praying so you can believe. It's a constant thing. Your faith is, can I say it? Annual. It's not permanent. It's from this level to that level. It's to deal with this mountain today and tomorrow it will be this mountain again and the next day it will be this mountain and every day you've got to take this word. You've got to hide it in your heart. You've got to pour it on your soul. You've got to shine it in your spirit. You've got to let the word test you until the Lord says it's time for it to come to pass. So what did Jesus mean when he said, you got to take up a cross every day? Not once, but every day. And if you don't love me more than you love your mother, your father, your houses, your land, your children, you cannot be my disciple. One other time he used a pretty strong word. He said, if you don't hate your mother and father and family more than me, you're not worthy of me. He didn't mean an emotional wrath towards them. Hate was an expression. Well, it's like when uh, uh, Paul talked about Jacob and Esau in Romans. He said that God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It did not mean that he despised him and wanted to wipe him out. It meant I've chosen Jacob over Esau. Jesus was saying, unless you can choose me over your baby, over your husband, over your goods, unless I am more important than your family, you are not worthy of me. You cannot be my disciple. Boy, that sound, sounds pretty strong, it, isn't it? It's demanding. It's almost scary. You mean to the exclusion of everything I have and everything he's given me, I must love him first and foremost? You mean even after I have received a blessing and a promise as Abraham did, God might just ask for it back because it, takes up a place in my heart that belongs to him? Yes, that's what I'm saying here today. Listen, when you want nothing but God, you can have all of God. When you don't want anything but God, you can have God and everything. When you want God, Jesus, more than you want this request answered, this prayer answered, this is not easy for me to preach, but it's what he taught. When you want him more than you want to see this answer and this request fulfilled, then you will have God and everything else that God 
as promised. I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. Something I heard the other day kind of stimulated me to think about this. I, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and you know, we all did it the same way. We opened the service with, anybody have a prayer request? Every time. Anybody got a special request? And every time, hands went up, and some people stood up and said, I want y'all to pray for me, I need. I want y'all to help me pray about this. I want you to help me pray about that. And I've been thinking about this. Our needs have overwhelmed us. We have become need-oriented in our praying. I heard somebody say this the other day, and I, I, I was just stunned by it. Anybody got a prayer request? You will never hear anybody say, pray that I will know him like I've never known him. We're always praying about individual mountains. This mountain is in my way. We're always praying about things that keep us up at night and make us uncomfortable. It's people or situations. I wish I could say this the way I'm feeling it. Holy Spirit, help me right now. We are encompassed by our problems and we are driven by our needs and our prayers and our worship services are all about getting God to give us something. Rather than saying, God heard me the first time I prayed. Now I know there's a place for intercession. I know that Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. I know the Bible says pray without ceasing. I know all of that. But shouldn't there be a time where we honestly recognize he heard me the first time I prayed? My God knows what I need even before I ask. I lay that Isaac at his feet. I ask for nothing except to know you better, God. I want to know you, God. I wonder what would happen in this church if all of us would stop praying about and being obsessed with and pouring over our problems and we started running after Jesus, seeking the heart of God, knowing that he's going to take care of his children. My God, he knows the things that plague you and burden you. He's going to help you. But what would happen if we just wanted God more than we wanted to be alive. What would happen if the scriptures became alive as the deer pants after the water brook? So my soul pants after you, O oh God, for the true and living God. David even got to the place where he said, my heart and my flesh fail. They get weak. They melt because of my hunger and my desire for more of God. Oh, if God could deliver us from neediness. I, don't misunderstand me today. I'm a needy man. I need God. I can't breathe without him. We can do nothing. But when our whole life is about getting stuff done, and thinking that faith is some kind of force that makes God do it rather than faith being that attitude that says, I want God so much that I'm going to give something up. This is taking up too much of my time. This dominates my thinking. I'm giving it up because I want to know him. Are you willing to give up stuff to know him better? Or do you want just enough of God to keep you soothed and satisfied? What would you be willing to abandon to know him in the likeness of his resurrection? The power of his resurrection, I should say. What would you be willing to give up? You know, earlier... I had Sandra come up here and we were, she was talking about holiness last night. 
And I remember as a little boy, there were lots of rules you had to keep. And they involved a lot of practical things. I won't drink this. I won't wear that. I won't participate here. And all of that was done in an attempt to be holy. But a lot of times we didn't want to give them up. I can tell you today, I don't mind giving anything up. There's no habit, there's no hobby that I am clinging to right now. God spoke to me weeks and weeks ago about giving up some things in my life, some fun things, things that have taken time away from Him. See, I'm at the place now, I told somebody the other day, I'm, I'm circling now. I'm coming in for a landing soon. I'm giving it all I've got for his name's sake. I want to know him. There's not anything I wouldn't want to give up. I can honestly say that. And I did give up some things and I haven't missed them one bit. I've had more time with God. I've had a better understanding of the Holy Scriptures. And I've come to realize that the power of faith is not always getting something from God, but being willing to stand there and say, take it all. Just let me know you better. Paul said, I have suffered the loss of all things that I may win Christ. Some of that was voluntary. Some of it wasn't. But listen to the wording of it. I have suffered the loss of all things that I might win Christ. I'm going after Christ. He's already caught me, but I'm going after him. He came and found me, but now I'm searching for him. I'm already saved. I'm in his will. I'm in his care. My name is in his book and he's in my heart. But I want that heart. I want to go after that heart. I want to follow hard after God. You see, I'm already saved. You can't make me doubt it. I'm on my way to heaven. Jesus lives in me. Oh, but I want him. I'm not satisfied. We've not built a searching people in these last days. We've not taught the church to seek and search for God and his holiness. And yet the scriptures say, and you will seek for me and find me when you search for me with all of your hearts. He's not talking about finding God to be saved. He's talking about fullness and faith and fruit and happiness and joy unspeakable because when I go after him, I'm pursuing who he is. So I would submit to you one more time. Maybe faith isn't just getting another thing, getting another answer, getting another request fulfilled. Maybe faith isn't just saying to this mountain today, be gone. Maybe faith, greater faith, uh, exceedingly great faith says, I don't have to have anything else except you. I want you. I don't know any other thing or any other way to preach it except what the Lord laid on me yesterday. We're in the last days. Jesus is coming. Well, he could call us today. He's either coming for us or we're going to him one way or the other. We're leaving. <clears throat> this is not a day to be, in my opinion, storing up and accruing stuff. It's not a day to be building bigger barns. This is a day to realize that God is available in fullness, that God has more for us waiting than we can possibly imagine, that your eye has not seen and your ear has never heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. For those who have decided, I'm sick of this world, it gives me, I don't want to re-preach it. 
For those of you who have gone to one fig tree after another to be satisfied only to find that there's nothing there. You ought to let it wither up in your life and realize that nothing satisfies but Jesus. Can I make it any clearer? You will never be happy till you're running after God. You will never be fulfilled till you're chasing God down. You will never be who you ought to be till you are hiding his word in your heart, till you are longing for, I mean, crying out for more of God until you can say about everybody and everything, I'd rather have Jesus. You're second in my life. You will never know the beauty, the power, and the fullness of salvation. That's my prayer for you today. I've got church members watching, friends watching, pastors watching. All I ask is that you consider what you've heard. Think about it. If time is running out, if Jesus is coming soon, why have we got all this clutter around us? Why all this junk Can I say it this way? Why all these fruitless fig trees? Why do we stand there impotent in front of this mountain and cry when God says, go after me, then you can say to this mountain, be gone. And just as surely as you believe, it will be removed. Hallelujah. I got one more. This just came to me. I believe it's in the book of Zechariah chapter 4 where Zerubbabel was given a task to perform by God that was utterly impossible for a man to do. That was rebuild walls in a city. And the Lord referred to that problem as a mountain. Not a literal mountain, but a task and a problem so big that it looked like a mountain. But God said, in front of you, Zerubbabel, this mountain shall become a level plain. And I'm declaring that to you this day. If by faith you will stand in front of this mount, hallelujah, this mountain right now, and cry out for God, God himself will make that mountain level. He will remove it from your life so you can go to the next place of learning and faith and power. Lord, if there's anybody listening to me right now who isn't saved, would you speak to their hearts today and remind them or or alert them to the fact that there's no salvation outside of you and there's no life outside of you. If you're not saved... Whether whether you feel this or not, whether you understand it or not, call on his name. Just simply say, Jesus, if you're there, hear me. I ask you to save me. You'll be amazed at what will happen. If you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, examine yourself. Is there too much clutter in your life? Have you a divided love and interest? Do you try to work God into all of your other loves? You'll never be happy. You'll never bear fruit until you say to everything, I'd rather have Jesus. I give it up to know Him better. Thank you for joining today. If Jesus doesn't come, you can tune in tomorrow night for prayer meeting. God's doing a work in our staff, and you will hear the prayers and hear the songs as we prayed last Tuesday morning. If you want a little word of encouragement, tune in Tuesday morning at 7. About a two-minute word that might just start your day right. God be with you all day long. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. God, please let them be acceptable 
in your sight, in your hearing. Let my meditation be sweet to your ears. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Till next time.